Today, Kushbu and I are going to read the 14th discourse of the Bhagavad Gita, which one translation calls the three qualities, and one, the Sharma translation calls uh, the discourse of the yoga of discrimination between the three gunas. So you take your pick on the translation and uh, we will be reading from, I, I'm reading from um, the Penguin Classic of the Bhagavad Gita translated by Laurie Patton, which is a more poetic version. I'm also reading from a translation by Sri Purohit Swami, the Skylight Illuminations Bhagavad Gita, uh, published by Skylight Paths Publishing of Vermont. And I'm reading from uh, the Bhagavad Gita, translated by R.K. Sharma, uh, with Carol Pitts and Les Morgan. Um, and so, and that translation is sort of between the, the poetic and the prose. So, uh, just to give you a choice of understanding. So, we will begin with the 14th discourse of the Bhagavad Gita, Slok 1. Jnana, Jnana Muttamma, Yajgyatva, Munayah, Sarve, Para, Siddhi Mito, Gataha. Slok 1. The patent reads, The Blessed One said, I will tell you again the highest wisdom. When the sages came to know this utmost wisdom, they went from here to the highest fulfillment. Prose reads, now, uh, Lord Sri Krishna continued, Now I will reveal unto you the wisdom which is beyond knowledge, by attaining which the sages have preached perfection. I'm sorry. By attaining which the sages have reached perfection. Sharma reads, The Blessed Lord said, I will further describe that supreme knowledge, the best of all types of knowledge, by knowing which all sages have achieved the supreme attainment beyond this world. Slope two. Shritya mama sadhmarya magataha sarge dapi nopajayante pralaye na vyathati cha. Slok 2. The patent reads, After they have arrived at this wisdom, the same essence as myself, they do not come into being at the creation, nor do they tremble at the dissolution. The prose reads, Dwelling in wisdom and realizing my divinity, they are not born again when the universe is recreated at the beginning of every cycle nor are they affected when it is dissolved. The Sharma reads, Having taken shelter in this knowledge, those who have become identified with my nature are neither reborn at the time of creation nor afflicted at the time of dissolution. Slok 3. Uh, Tasmi nagarbha daya myahama sambhavaha sarva bhutana tam tato bhavati bharata. The patent reads, Son of Bharata, the great Brahman is my womb. In this I place the embryo. From that emerges the origin of all beings. Prose reads, the eternal cosmos is my womb, in which I plant the seed from which all beings are born, O Prince. And the Sharma reads, 
the great Brahman, Prakti, Prakti, is for me the womb in which I put the seed. From that, the birth of all beings takes place, O descendant of Bharata. There's a footnote. The cosmic embryo constitutes the origin of the universe. When the seed is put in the womb, the cosmic soul is activated and all beings are created. This cosmic soul is called Hiranya Garbha, Hiranya Garbha, the golden embryo. The great Brahman, the womb, is here close to Prakti, na pra Prakriti, nature, consisting of the three gunas. The implication here is that the manifested world ultimately comes from the unmanifested. Thus, they are essentially one. Slope four. Slope three. Uh, that was slope three. Slope four. Yeah. Sarva Yonishu Konteya Murtaya Sambhavanti Ya Tasha Brahma Mahadhuni Raha. Bridge up that aha pitaha slope four. The pattern reads Son of Kunti, Brahman is the great root, Brahman is the great womb of all forms that exist. I am the father who places the seeds. The prose reads O illustrious, O illustrious son of Kunti. Through whatever wombs men are born, it is the spirit itself that conceives, and I am their father. And the Sharma reads, O oh, whatever my manifestations are produced from all wombs, O son of Kunti, the great Brahman Prakriti is their womb, and I am the father who gives the seed. Slope five. Iti gunaha prakruti sambhavaha nibdana anti mahabaho dehe dehi nama vyayama. Slope five. The pattern reads Strong armed one, sattva, rajas, and tamas are gunas born of matter. They bind the embodied, imperishable one within the body. The prose reads, Purity, passion, and ignorance are the qualities which the law of nature brings forth. They fetter the free spirit in all beings. There's a footnote. The three qualities, sattva, purity, rajas, passion, and tamas, ignorance, are first mentioned in chapter 2, see chapter 2, note 17, and there's a generic footnote on this page, three thieves fell upon a merchant who was on his way home and robbed him. Thomas wanted to kill the merchant in order to destroy any trace of the crime. The other two hesitated, and Rajas said, let's tie him to a tree. Whether or not he is found will depend on his karma. They bound him to a tree and hurried away. After a while, Sattva returned and cut the ropes. The merchant was overjoyed. You've saved my life, he said. Come back to the village with me, and I'll reward you. No, that won't do, replied Sattva. The police know me to be a thief. The only thing I could do was release you from your bonds. And, unquote, that is the parable of Ramakrishna, who adds, Sattva is also a robber. It cannot give man the ultimate knowledge of truth, though it shows him the road leading to the supreme abode of God. Sharma reads, Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas, these are the gunas constituting nature that bind the imperishable embodied consciousness in the body, O long-armed one. Slok 6. 
कृत्वा तप्रकाशकम ना मयम सुखद सेदन बधनाति ज्ञान सदेन चानद श्लोक थ्री श्लोक सिक्स blameless one their sattva is stainless and brings light it binds by connection to joy and by connection to wisdom that was the pattern the prose reads o sinless one of these pure of these purity being luminous strong and invulnerable binds one by its yearning for happiness and illumination the sharma reads of these due to its purity sattva is illuminating and healthy it binds consciousness by attachment to happiness and by attachment to knowledge o sinless one slok 7 atmaka vidhi trishna sada samuphavama tanni badhanati कोणतेय कर्मसद्देन देन देही नम श्लोक 7 सन ऑफ कुंती रिकॉग्नाइज दैट राजस हैज द नेचर ऑफ पॅशन अराइजिंग फ्रॉम कनेक्शन टू थर्स्ट इट बाइंड्स दिस एम्बॉडीड वन थ्रू कनेक्शन टू एक्शन दैट वाज द पॅटर्न प्रोज रीड्स passion engendered by thirst for pleasure and attachment binds the soul through its fondness for activity the sharma reads understand rajas as characterized by passionate attachment born of thirst and attachment it it binds the embodied consciousness by its egoistic attachment to action o son of kunti slok 8 na ja vidida mohana sarva dehi nama pramadalasya nidra mist ninti badhanati bharata slok 8 o son of bharata recognize that tamas is born of ignorance and is the confusion of all embodied ones it binds through sleep laziness and distraction that is the pattern the prose reads but ignorance the product of darkness stupefies the senses in all embodied beings binding them by the chains of folly indolence and lethargy Sharma reads on the other hand understand tamas is a product is on the other hand understand tamas as a product of ignorance and a deluding factor for all beings it binds consciousness with negligence laziness and drowsiness o descendant of varata slok 9 b raja कर्मणि भारत ज्ञानमावृत्य तु तम प्रमादे सज्जयत्युता श्लोक 9 the pattern reads son of bharata sattva brings connection to joy rajas brings connection to action tamas brings connection to neglect and obscures wisdom prose reads purity brings happiness passion commotion and ignorance which obscures wisdom leads to a life of failure and the sharma reads sattva clings to happiness rajas to egoistic action o descendant of bharata but tamas covering over knowledge truly clings to negligence slok 10 have in ayurveda even food is looked at in this categories rajas and tamas and 
yeah food is also looked from that perception i see um can you do you have any further illumination on that i mean how i guess food satvik satvik food means like really pure minimalistic like a vegan food is is almost like satvik food okay. and non is tamas fruit like a uh, tamas nature so kings and warriors ate non veg sages ate satvik food i see and there's a difference to it and uh, then then there is there is a tam uh, rajas food so things in between like potato is rajas food millet banana this kind of food is is considered as rajas it's not pickled food are also uh, rajas rajas food mm-hmm. like they are not very natural i, I don't know about mu- much about the rajas food category but like total non veg warrior kind of food is is uh, yeah i think so 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 that, yeah yeah and and so um i know that jains are very strict about their food consumption um i have a friend who's a jain and so that would be sattva food satvik satvik Sat- yeah okay, yeah. okay. This is, the jain is the religion which is like kind of around gujarat at that time and gandhi ji and their their mythology around a uh, lot of practices around non violent action and life right that is gandhi ji also like it was a cultural wisdom of the place he came from i see not yeah not the no he was not from that religion but it's like i know a lot of things about islam because i have a lot of muslim friends Mm-hmm. Something like that. I, yeah. No, I from, it's about non-violence, Jain. So they don't even eat what grows underground. Right. Yeah. In fact, um, <laughs> one time we had this Jain man with us out on a sailboat weekend, so we had to prepare the food in advance, and uh, Debbie had prepared this. wonderful um potato salad and uh this uh jane man um said absolutely he could not eat that because potatoes have the most living beings in them and so so the jane um it, it's it's against jane custom to eat a potato um and they only eat as few living beings as possible which is understandable i mean all life lives on other life and so the jain perspective i think is to live on a, as little other life as possible anyway so are you ready slope 10 yeah actually not live on possible other life but not creating suffering fruit unnecessary suffering footprint behind i see okay well that's fair now yeah so potato is a food for other creatures who live inside the ground kind of yeah. that is yes. how it is look yeah sure yeah sorry slope 10 rajas rajastha mascha भवति भारत थामस Thomas can prevail over Satva and Rajas. The 
prose reads, O Prince, purity prevails when passion and ignorance are overcome. Passion when passion when purity and ignorance are overcome, and ignorance when it overcomes purity and passion. And there's a footnote. Sri Iswaran suggests how one can overcome the qualities. The way to transform tamas into rajas is through activity. Then slowly we have to transform rajas into sattva. We must begin to direct all of our energies to the selfless service of those around us. We can harness our energy and restlessness and direct it to the supreme goal. Sharma reads. When the light of, uh, I'm sorry, we're on 10, okay. Sattva prevails over overcoming rajas and tamas, O descendant of Bharata. Rajas prevails over after overcoming sattva and tamas. And likewise, tamas prevails over after overcoming sattva and rajas. There's a footnote. See Samkhya Karika 12b. Quote, the gunas mutually subdue and shelter one another, giving birth to and coexisting with one another. Sloka 11. Uh, Minan Prakasha Upajayate Gyana Yadatada Vidya Di Vrudatya Sattva mit yuta. Slok 11. When a light is born in all doorways of this body, and when wisdom occurs, then one should know that sattva has grown strong. That was the pattern. The prose reads, When the light of knowledge gleams forth from all of the gates of the body, then be sure that purity prevails. The Sharma reads, when the light of knowledge shines through all the gates of the body, then one may know that sattva is truly predominant. Slok 12. Bhaha Karmana mash Shamaha Spruha Rajashitani Jayante Vibhudati Bharata Sharmbaha Slope 12. The pattern reads Bull of Bharatas, greed, exertion, the beginning of action, restlessness, and lust are born when Rajas has grown strong. The prose reads, O best of Indians, avarice, the impulse of act, the impulse to act and the beginning of action itself are all due to the dominance of passion. And the Sharma reads, when rajas is predominant, greed, activity, initiation of actions, restlessness, and, long, and longing appear, O bull of, among the Bharatas. Let's look 13. Cha, Pramado, Moha, Eva Cha, Tamasye Tani, Jayante, Vibru and Vibrun the K Kuru Nandana Slope 13. The pattern reads Son of Kuru, absence of light, absence of exertion, neglect, and confusion are born when Tamas has grown strong. The prose reads. Darkness, stagnation, folly, and infatuation are the result 
of the dominance of ignorance, O oh joy of the Kulu clan. And the Sharma reads, descendant of the Kurus, when Tamas is predominant, truly these characteristics appear, lack of illumination, inactivity, negligence, and delusion. And there's a footnote. The term vivride, meaning preponderance or dominance, clarifies that it is impossible to live without all three gunas. The ideal situation is that the three gunas are in balance. An appropriate growth of the, of the guna of sattva leads to happiness. Too much growth of the gunas rajas and tamas leads to unhappiness. As stated in verse 14.9, eventually, however, the aspirant's path leads to non-attachment from all three gunas. Slope 14. Dade tu pralaya yati deha bruta tado tma vida loka na loka nama la napra Tipadhate, slope 14. The patent reads, when sattva has grown strong, the embodied one goes to dissolution. Then one enters the stainless realms of those who know the highest. The prose reads, when purity prevails, the soul on quitting the body passes on to the pure regions where, li where live those who know the highest. The Sharma reads, Furthermore, when an embodied being dies with preponderance of sattva, then he attains the pure worlds of those who have the highest knowledge. So Kushbu and I have been reading from the 14th Discourse of the Bhagavad Gita, verses 1 through 14, and we'll go on with the rest of Discourse 14 on Monday. Thank you very much, Kushbu. See you on Monday.